Very good. All right, you ready to go? Oh, uh, one last thing. Are you going to get upset if I call you St. Andrew? Uh, <laughs> you really want to do that? <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's almost like um, it needs to be addressed because a lot of people think that I'm like just running this thing behind the... I'm like this master, you know, master of puppets here or, or something. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it, I, I got to look at it as, as it's pretty damn cool to to have some kids out there that, that make a, you know, a parody page, I guess, about you. Welcome back to the PFC podcast. The views and opinions you are about to hear are the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else. Now on to the podcast. Welcome back to the PFC Podcast. This is Dennis, and today we are talking with Andrew Fisher. On the Damage Control Resuscitation CPG. Uh, thank you, Andy, for coming on to the podcast. If you would, though, uh, please introduce yourself to the few people that have not heard about you. All right. Hey, thanks, uh, Dennis, for having me out here today. Um, so my background is currently I'm a medical student at Texas A&M College of Medicine. Prior to that, I was a PA in the 75th Ranger Regiment. And I spent about 10 years uh, doing, um, doing some stuff with them. Uh, went started at First Ranch Battalion as a as a PA in 2007, and uh, ended my career to go to medical school in 2016, um, where I was at Fort Benning as the regimental PA. Uh, currently, I am a PA still in the Texas Army National Guard, and uh, continue to participate as much as possible in you know uh, soft medicine, pre hospital medicine, uh, TCCC. Uh, I am also, I'm a committee member on the, uh, a voting member on the committee for on tax for combat casualty care. And, uh, I think that's about wraps it up. I think anything else I'm missing. Yeah. No, I think you nailed about everything. Um, just all in all a huge advocate for the combat medic and, uh, you know, the things you, you advocate for us, um, with on these committees, you know, has really helped combat medicine i think um in the entire dod not just uh not just our little corner of the world but what i would like to first ask about this uh cpg is what is the difference between rdcr or remote damage control resuscitation and damage control resuscitation really i think i think the biggest uh, difference between the you know, remote DCR versus, you know, hospital DCR is just simply where it takes place. Uh, there certainly are limitations that can happen, but when you take, um, you know, what's supposed to happen inside the hospital and put it into a remote area, uh, we, uh, we try our best to, uh, duplicate what takes place, but as, as you know, it's not always possible. As far as, you know, how do you define remote, um, remote damage control resuscitation. I don't think there's any good one definition for it. Uh, it's, uh, you know, people have tried to explain it. Um, you know, could that be, you know, in a remote wilderness setting here in the United States, or is it, you know, maybe in a, in a, um, developing country, uh, and, and you're in a house sort of setting, uh, where you can't necessarily use the local hospitals, our local healthcare facilities. So it's, it's kind of a, um, a little bit of a nebulous definition, I think. And it just all kind of depends on your take on it and what your capabilities are, uh, in that, in that, uh, remote, uh, setting. What are your, what are your major priorities when you're doing damage control resuscitation? Uh, I think first and foremost, I think you have to be able to master, um, tactical combat casualty care. So you have to understand the fundamentals of that and accomplish those goals first before moving on to something 
like, uh, you know, the, um, damage control resuscitation. So priorities obviously then would be obviously be can, being able to control any, um, hemorrhage, uh, um, either from the junctional or, uh, limb hemorrhage, uh, you know, because a lot of what we do in damage control resuscitation has to do with the non-compressible torso hemorrhage that occurs in, in a significant number of, uh, potentially survivable deaths. After that, you know, just going on down the algorithm of March, uh, airway respiration, circulation, et cetera, uh, is, a, is very important. Um, and once you recognize that that your patient is in hemorrhagic shock or is going to need resuscitation and you've accomplished those fundamentals, then it's about um, first and foremost, probably putting, um, or I'm um, sorry, starting, uh, you know, some sort of blood transfusion, I think is is a should that's probably should where the emphasis should be placed, I guess. And if you're going to start resuscitating. And that's a, that's a really good point. How you uh, highlighted it's, it's more about the, uh, the uncompressible hemorrhage, the thoracic trauma, the abdominal trauma, where you cannot compress the hemorrhage that you're going to now do damage control resuscitation versus if you have hemorrhage controlled with the tourniquet or, or, or whatever mechanism you, you have hemorrhage control, there's no great reason to keep uh, a patient at a uh, permissive hypotension or, you know, what you would try and achieve in damage control resuscitation. There's no real reason to keep a patient, uh, their blood pressure that low. Is that correct? Yeah, I think uh, in the pre-hospital setting, actually, I think anything really probably in these remote settings or um, prior to going to surgery, a lot of what we do would be considered, you know, hypotensive resuscitation per se. But certainly there, if you, you know, if someone has a uh, amputation and they have a limb tourniquet in place, uh, but they are sewing some, uh, they blood out to the point where they're having some signs and symptoms of hemorrhagic shock. I agree. There isn't necessarily a, a reason to be as concerned about, uh, uh, you, you know, being careful with the, with the resuscitation or as careful with resuscitation as you might be with someone who may have, yeah, like a non-compressible um, torso hemorrhage. Another thing on uh, social media, you know, I've, uh, I've seen you, you've started up a, a course on, on hemorrhage control, an advanced procedure for hemorrhage control called the Raptor course, where you learn about Raboa, um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so this was, um, I, I guess, you know, I, I've been a huge uh, proponent, uh, as you mentioned previously, of, of you know, different things in the pre-hospital setting and trying to kind of push the limits of, of what we do uh, and, and but to do in a, in a manner that's um, one, safe, two, effective, and probably three, you know, uh, have some sort of evidence behind it uh, to support our to, to support it. Um, so with uh, you know Dr. John Holcomb, Dr. Uh, Zaf Kasim, uh, we started the uh, what it's called the Raptor course, but uh, it stands for resuscitation adjuncts uh, for the pre-hospital transfusion and Raboa. And uh, really, what we're trying to do here is to educate. You know, pre-hospital professionals, both, uh, you know, or whatever, maybe, maybe a physician, paramedic, uh, you know, SOCOM, 18 Delta, combat medic, uh, nurse, PA, whoever it is, uh, kind of teach them in a way that uh, allows them to potentially take the concept of a bow to the pre-hospital setting. And, and we we're really kind of try to get people to understand that this tool isn't necessarily a, a just a simply go to something you can do, but you have to, it has to be carefully uh, planned in a way that, that uh, you're one, it's a team effort. So they have to be able to approach this as a team and understand the mechanism um, of injury, the potential outcomes that may happen, the uh, some of the adverse effects that come with this, but also that you really can't do this without whole blood. So we talk a lot about, you know, performing proper resuscitation with whole blood uh, on your casualty before stepping up uh, and going to something as significant as Raboa. But yeah, we started this and uh, right now we're running the course out of Houston 
and uh, and working with a lot of different uh, vendors that kind of have helped put this uh, made this possible. And of course, we're, we're not taking a profit from this. This is simply uh, you know just to make sure that that we're teaching people how to do this properly. And we got a lot of uh, great experts that come in and, and help teach us, including uh, Joe DeBose, um, uh, Joe Love, and and other people. So it's a it's a fantastic course. Again, I'm not trying to make any money off of it. We're just trying to make sure we're teaching people the proper way to implement whole blood and Rebo for the pre-hospital setting. Oh, outstanding. Um, do you go over other hemorrhage control devices? Like if I can't, it's not in my in my uh, scope of practice to do Reboa, but are there, are you going over other options for a uh, more non-compressible hemorrhage? Um, uh, it depends. So, so we know right now that there aren't a lot of options for non-compressible torso hemorrhage. So, uh, one, we, yes, we, we cover things that all the way up to the junctional hemorrhage. So limb tourniquets, junctional tourniquets, wound packing, et cetera. But at the same time, when we get to the non-compressible torso hemorrhage, we kind of, we can't be so definitive about how to address, address these issues. Uh, we talk about, uh, the, like the rescue foam, which t- seems to have a lot of promise, but you know, at the, at this time, it's not necessarily a, an option for really anyone out there. Uh, we talk about, um, the, like the AAJT or the abdominal aortic junctional tourniquet. Uh, and we talk about the, uh, we talk about it and how it may be used either as an adjunct or as a primary tool, um, but there's certainly not a lot of casualties out there that would benefit uh, from from the AHAT. Uh, if there's a previous, there's a recent study that demonstrated that about nine percent of the people who um, were in this cohort would have benefited from AHAT, where ninety six percent would have benefited from Reboa. Hmm. Oh, outstanding. Um, just moving on a little bit farther down the CPG. In under advanced capabilities, you talk about labs like uh, INR, uh, hemoglobin, hematocrit, lactate, pH based deficit. Um, ultrasound is becoming a lot more common uh, on teams loadout. Uh, for doing fast exams, they can do regional blocks. There's there's a, a lot of things you uh, guys can do with it. But I'm starting to wonder, um, should things like uh, portable lactate monitors um, be included in Teams loadout? Uh, I don't think that we should limit any sort of um, tool that evaluates the patient status in the pre-hospital setting. You know, if, if someone wants to carry a tool that will help them guide their resuscitation or give them information about their patient status, I don't see that necessarily as a bad thing, a- at least from the the information that uh, that is discussed within the CPG. So, yeah, uh, ultrasound, fantastic. That can give you a lot of great information. Uh, base deficit, obviously, can give you some good information. INR give you uh, some information. Uh, lactate, I think, is a is a good tool. Uh, I, unfortunately, I don't think we have a lot of great um, um, uh, instruments right now that really provide us that, or I should say that cannot be used in the pre-hospital combat setting. Uh, you know, but that's, that's only a matter of time before we're going to probably have a, a lactate uh, monitor that we'll be able to we'll be able to use and will be affordable uh, and will probably meet a lot of the criteria that we're looking for in the military. I think there's a lot. I think there's a lot of people are calling for it, so it's just a matter of time. Yeah, I think you're right. But in the meantime, we do have things like the Emma or some other type of uh, end tidal CO2 monitoring. Uh, do you think these are reliable surrogates until we get? Uh, these portable lactate monitors that are reliable and rugged. Uh, yes, I, I think I think again that that any tool that um, is is reliable based upon evidence and and uh, can be utilized effectively uh, in the PFC situation uh, should be considered. Um, yeah, entitled CO two we know is is a decent tool. 
uh, that can give you some information about how your patient, uh, about the state, um, um, about how your patient is, is currently doing, then, then you should be able to use it and may help you guide in the resuscitation a little bit. Uh, maybe, maybe not as much as lactate, uh, but certainly can, can be of use. Absolutely. As long as I think as long as you understand how you got that number or what that number is actually telling you, not just following data points and making adjustments based on data points, but taking everything into context of what is going on, then making a decision, you know, not just putting your, uh, your faith completely in one number as you move along. Yeah, I think that it's an excellent point that, uh, yeah, you have to understand how these tools operate and exactly what they're measuring uh, based upon, you know, whatever, uh, um, uh, you know, pathway in the body that this is kind of taking how they get, you know, like I said, get that measurement. Uh, and then, yeah, not taking just one number. We all know lactate. If I take a lactate of, of someone who may be just injured, but they, you know, were, were, moving vigorously or through, uh, you know, through a, a target and they get injured, you know, there's a lot of anaerobic metabolism going on in the body whenever a lot of these guys are on target. Plus they're already probably a little dehydrated. So they may have just a high lactate, initial high, lac- uh, high lactate. Does that mean that they're, you know, they're going to have a poor outcome? Not necessarily. I have to be able to trend that that vital sign, if you want to consider the vital sign or turn that lab over time to help guide that resuscitation. And also, like I said, like you said, you have to understand how that number is produced within the body. Moving on to uh, blood products. So best, you know, low titer, O blood uh, for everybody would be the best. Under that, under better, you have, you've changed the old adage just a little bit. Uh, the old ad is being A for A, O for one, everyone else. Now it's chained to A for A, O for O, and low titer O, o blood for B and AB patients. Pre-drawn uh, whole blood on the battlefield is a very finite uh, commodity. Do I save the blood, the pre-drawn blood for my B and AB patients, and then for my A and O patients, draw there in the field? Or do you think it's more of a first come first serve type thing? I, th- my belief, or I guess how I would go about it is, I think just simply based upon the numbers, you're, I get more likely to have a a group O uh, casualty versus a group AB casualty. So I don't think it's necessarily to me makes sense to save that blood for someone who's AB. You know, if, it, if your listeners don't know the kind of breakdown of, of blood groups within the United States um, and a lot of, of Western Hemisphere is we have about, um, I've seen numbers from about 45 to about 60 percent are group O, um, roughly 40 percent, 45 percent is group A and you get about 20 percent of B and then and then AB takes up the rest, you know, over 5, 10 percent, whatever. So in between there is some, some, the truth, I guess. And, and I've done this at a lot of fresh old blood transfusion training is we'll simply ask, Hey, who's O, who's A, uh, you know, B and AB. And typically it breaks down like that, that you see about, uh, about 50% are, are O, um, you know, 40% are A, and then you break down between B and AB. Uh, sometimes you don't even get AB in there because it's, it's just not a very, a lot of people don't. Um, such a small percentage of the of the population, so I think I think if you were to try if you were going to say this low titer for that for that group A A B person that you may not even have you know may not even be out there, uh, and I'm not saying that you don't pre screen for for people who are on target, but I think we we try to identify our group O people before they go out um, simply because they can be donors. Uh, we're not doing a lot of screening for, Hey, who's a B. So I know who you are. Um, so I don't know if that's the best ideas to save it for the group AB that may or may not happen. Um, versus, you know, having group O out there and group A, which probably are about, you know, 80 to 85% of your people on target is probably better to go ahead and, and 
treat treat who needs to be treated with your grupo. And again, if you if you're stuck in like maybe a, if you're in an ODA and you've got you know twelve guys out there, and uh, you know you, that's probably a better time to do group A to group A and group O to everyone else. And yeah, if you have your low titer donors identified for fresh whole blood, then maybe they go to the B and AB versus your regular O patients can give to any O patient. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. No, absolutely. I mean, it just comes down to knowing what the, what's the blood type of the, the guys you're working with, having that on a sheet and being able to identify, um, I personally, I don't, I really doubt I would be saving my pre-drawn blood um, for, you know, this, this patient that's a potential when I have one in front of me. And, you know, I've watched how long it takes to actually draw blood. And even though, you know, people will tell me, oh, I can do it in five minutes or I can do it in, you know, six minutes and 18 seconds. When I ask them to go ahead and do it, Usually they're the ones that take 20 minutes uh, to actually get a full bag. So, you know, having blood on, t- on pre-drawn for me, I would just spike it and send it. Yeah, and I, I think that's the best practice. I mean, again, we're not, we're not trying to we – can't, we can't necessarily determine, hey, who's going to be injured and when and where. So, uh, yeah, g- giving, giving blood to a patient that needs it is, is the priority. Right. I think so. Um, Another priority, I think, is also TXA. Um, There's also a little bit of a change in this CPG versus conventional thought in that if you do not have uh, the the saline bag to deliver TXA over 10 minutes, that it's okay to do a slow push. Uh, I guess my first question is, well, how slow is it? And... Uh, the second part of that is, has the risk of hypotension uh, because of a rapid push, has that not really borne out? Has it not really, you know, we're not really seeing it like it's been advertised? Yeah. I think if you look in the data, I'm not sure you're able to identify the exact prevalence of transient hypotension that is associated with doing a slow IV push at TXA. Uh, I've tried to find it and I haven't really been able to, to tease it out of the, the information uh, that's presented. So I'm not sure. I, I, I probably think that pushing TXA over, you know, a few minutes in a syringe is probably safe. Uh, if you talk to people like Joe DeBose, Bose. Um, who talk about the in the matters study that there was a lot of people that were just getting TXA via slow IV push. So I, I think also if you look crash too, there's a lot probably a lot of people that had the slow IV push. So it's it's recommended. This is the way it's currently recommended uh, within the TCCC guidelines uh, to do it, uh, hang it over ten minutes. Um, but I don't necessarily think think from the prolonged field care perspective that it is a bad thing or an unsafe act, I guess it should be better, probably better worded. So I don't think it's unsafe to be, to push TXA via slow IV push. Right. You know, yeah. on the flip side of that, I've seen people, you know, slam at home, like, a, like it was adenosine or something, you know, and I ask them, well, why, you know, why are you pushing it so fast? You know, what's the benefit of it? Um, really the only response I ever get back is, well, that's how the, that's how the Rangers do it, or that's how, you know, this other unit does it that usually this person is not part of. Um, there is there is very, very few drugs that actually need to be pushed that fast. And, you know, it's kind of a risk versus reward. Um, you know, I think if there was going to be a hypotensive event, it would be because of a very rapid push that didn't need to happen versus you know, a, you know, a, a long push, a longer push over one minute. Um, I mean, that's just good med admin, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I, I who know, no one is saying that, that you should be slamming this in and, and you're right. Uh, there are not very many drugs out there that stay push as fast as you can. And I don't think there are any protocols 
being utilized within the DOD that recommend slamming any drug in uh, outside of things like, yeah, adenosine, which if you're using adenosine in the pre-hospital setting and then in combat, then I don't know, maybe we got some, I'd like to hear about it, I guess. So uh, yeah, slow IV push, no one is saying slam it in, uh, be safe with any drug you have. You should know how, how all these drugs um, can potentially have adverse effects on your patient and how to maximize, or I guess I should say how to minimize the, those adverse effects and uh, maximize the safety profile. Mm-hmm. So would you recommend having, uh, having your blood on first or your plasma on first? Uh, getting that started and then pushing your TXA. Ooh, that's a that's I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, I, I I don't know if there's on the chance. Go ahead on the on the chance that there is a hypotensive event, which is very rare. You would already be set up to start bolusing fluids to to deal with that situation versus a more rapid push of TXA and then you're chasing, you know, a, a potential hypotensive event on top of the trauma that's already happened. You know, now you're in a, even a bigger rush um, to put resuscitation on board. You know, I'm a, I'm definitely a fan of TXA, but I think it's the blood that saves people's lives. Um, so personally, I want to see people put blood on first and then worry about, you know the the small leaks that are happening that TXA is gonna going to uh, fix. Yeah, my personal view. Yeah, I I I think uh, on some levels that may be a bit of a um, philosophical debate at this time, simply because we don't necessarily. I don't think we know. You know how you know what is what is should be the priority or if TXA is beneficial without, you know, like uh, without resuscitation with whole blood or plasma. Uh, I, I, I guess my perspective is, is what is readily available? What, uh, how many medics are on target? Uh, and how many people that are not medics are trained to assist you in a manner that, that, that maybe they can, do the TXA for you. Uh, we know in a lot of, a lot of times, special operations, we do train the non-medical people to be able to perform those duties. Like, Hey, uh, get the TXA out, you know, draw it up and give it to the patient. You know, they're not making the decision on when to do things, but certainly can execute a lot of these, uh, tasks for you, uh, in an effort to kind of streamline patient care. Uh, my, my perspective is that I was out there by myself and treating a patient, I I would agree with you. I'd probably start blood first, and then go with TXA uh, soon after. Obviously, in a in a separate line. So I think that's probably my perspective too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I also think that, um, yeah, that's kind of it's that is kind of a difficult one to discuss. I guess. Sorry about that. Or not now. I'm just kind of rambling. You have to cut. You have to cut that last part out. But yeah, I don't. Uh, I get. Uh, yeah. Anyways, all right. I'm good. No, I'm definitely leaving in. That's exactly the same thing I would do, Dennis. Definitely, that's probably going to be highlighted. I got uh, one more question. Uh, hypocalcemia during shock. I guess why one? Why does this happen in trauma patients? I mean, I understand them bleeding, but. The actual hypocalcemia, I guess I don't actually understand. Um, and should we now change how we describe the lethal triad to include hypocalcemia? So in hypo- hypocalcemia happens in trauma patients for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, certainly you get consumption of calcium uh, through the uh, um, through the body's own mechanisms. But as we then we begin to transfuse blood into our patients, especially in massive transfusion, uh, we start to see the citrate that is available and, and sort of the, the binding of, of calcium by citrate in, in the blood products. So I think it's kind of a multi, uh, you know, kind of a multi-prong issue that, that causes this hypocalcemia. 
there is a mortality associated with uh, hypocalcemia and massive transfusion patients. So we, I think it's important that we recognize that it's a possibility. Uh, there is a, uh, we don't have a good measurement, a true good measurement of those in, in the pre-hospital combat setting that are hypocalcemic, uh, but we do have a little bit of data from the role three perspective, and there are a significant portion of, of those casualties that are hypocalcemic uh, when they get to the hospital. So I think it's important that we probably give calcium early. Uh, I think after the first uh, first unit would be a good time to to give uh, a little bit of calcium. You know, we talk about which time, which one do you give? Do you have chloride versus gluconate? Uh, you know, calcium chloride is probably better or even, you know more. It's, uh, better bioavailability, but uh, gluconate is much safer. And I think that's probably the best one to go to in, in um, the pre-hospital setting. Uh, it comes, you know, the vials that are probably a little bit easier to carry than this, how calcium chloride is, uh, is uh, um, given to us. Uh, from the lethal triad perspective, and does it get added? Uh, I know it's kind of a hot topic within you know, pre-hospital medicine, TCCC, soft, um, PFC uh, situations. I don't know if we have the information enough to really say that it needs to be part of uh, the lethal triad just yet, but I think it's a good discussion point, and I think it's driving a lot of good uh, info, you know, a lot of future research, uh, PI projects, and other methods to determine if it does need to be part of the lethal triad. So uh, it, I, I'm not going to say, yes, it has to be it, or it should be at this point, but I'm saying I'm glad that we're investigating it in a manner that may provide us with the information. Um, you know, it's, and as far as, uh, you know, talking about training your non-medics, you know, I mean, you're ma- I think as a medic, you're making an enormous mistake not training your guys to do, you know, basic medical things. I mean, everybody's seen Saving Private Ryan. When the medic is wounded and nobody knows what to do, it's a really difficult time to now teach them. So just teaching them in basic T-Tri-C, which they're required to get, you know, is that's just good medicine, you know. And if you want other things, being able to do good, uh, you know, draw meds, which is a smart idea. Take vital signs, which is another smart idea, and not necessarily make decisions based on that, but at least feeding that information back to you so that you can make decisions and then tell them what to do next. I mean, that you're just making a, a far more effective team in a situation that they probably are not training in frequently. I, I agree. I think that's actually a, a huge point to to. A, to maybe how PSC is going to be successful, uh, but also how units like, you know, my previous unit, like 75th Ranger Regiment, how we were so successful, and that is to train the non-medical people how to assist the medic and how to do certain things without the medic's, you know, uh, oversight. So uh, I think we see this in TCCC All Combatants, that teaching people how to address those, you know, three most common causes of, you know, potentially survivable death is critical, but also teaching, you know, these people, how, you know, putting them through some sort of course that is, you know, de- developed at the unit level, how to, hey, here's how you start an IV, here's how, here's the medication, here's what it does, you know, and here's how you give it sort of, sort of thing and, and all sorts of different uh, ways to approach it. You know, hey, here's how you draw a fresh unit of whole blood. Uh, here's, you know, um, here's how you do a chest tube or finger thoracotomy um, or thoracostomy, whatever it may be. Uh, I know within, like I said, soft, we've done that very well uh, for both in, in group and in regiment. But I also think now that you're looking in the conventional forces, to, you're starting to see this become more popular. Uh, that, that they are starting to train these non-medics to be able to do these tasks that aren't uh, necessarily, um, you don't have to have a lot of medical knowledge to be able to do the task. 
And that's why the medic is there to make the decision that the task needs to be done. Uh, but you can utilize someone who just has the the knowledge of how to do it. Mm-hmm. Now, I think uh, I, out of out of courses like like Mountain Path or or Dark Woods or you know any of the other PFC type training I've seen where the entire team comes. Personally, I think that's where the money is actually made is in the team dynamics and in um, the non medics getting trained on how to do a, a large variety of procedures and then forced into a situation where they have to do it. Um, for the medics, I see it more as not necessarily the different skills. You know, they know how to do IVs, they know how to do airways, chest tubes, etc. But I don't think that they get a lot of practice putting everything together over a long period of time and having to make, uh, you know, life-saving decisions, you know, over 16 hours. You know, they're used to doing it over 15, 30 minutes, and then it's done. Um, so it's more of a rush of doing skills, not a, a, a lot of decision-making that needs to be done. I think that's the biggest takeaway from courses like that. Yeah, I, I agree. That's that's excellent. I, and I think that's one of the great uh, things that have come out of PFC and part of um, what group and, has, and other special operations units have done. Um, you know, simply from the, you know, I, I'm familiar with the, the regiment perspective and, um, you know, we had we have our approach with like advanced range of first responder, um, and try to utilize them in the same manner as is to bring them along to this training to ensure that they understand. So I, I love how group has been able to kind of incorporate the whole team approach in order to ensure that everyone has some has some skills to be able to take care of. You know that you know the, each person on the team if they were injured, um, because you guys do. Um, work in such a, in a smaller element and, and really, really need to, uh, have a good understanding of how to perform some of these skills. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, before we, we really delve into the training of things, because I think that's another podcast I would really like, uh, yourself, you know, and, or Ethan miles on is, you know, how did the Rangers move to that, uh, zero preventable deaths? Um, that'd be another excellent podcast. I think it would be a good podcast. Yeah. Do you want to do it today? Do it today. Yeah. Uh, without Ethan, uh, we should, uh, it would be good if we got Ethan on here too, and we could both do it. Let's try and get him on and, uh, kind of explain how that, that whole process of getting the command behind it. And then, I mean, that's how you make real change is getting the command behind something. Oh, yeah. Outstanding. Um, Is there anything else uh, you'd like to add to this? Cool, man. Hey, thank you. That's it for today's podcast. Be sure to go to our website, www.prolongfieldcare.org. Find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Subscribe and stay on the bleeding edge of combat medicine. This is Dennis for the PFC Podcast. Out. Boy is waiting there for you.